TikTok roasts. It's four scary things about planes pilots won't tell you. Coming up. Hey 74 crew, welcome back. If you don't know me, my name's Kelsey. I'm a 747 pilot. My channel, 74 Gear, is all about aviation. A few weeks ago, I put out a video roasting these TikTokers that were putting out information of what to do in emergencies while you're flying. What's funny is that several other influencers started picking up that content and just straight regurgitating it without doing any research of their own. And then I noticed in the comment section there, you all that watched my video started roasting them about how incorrect they were. That was funny. However, based on the amount of views that those TikTokers video originally got, I think it's pretty safe to say that there's going to be some people, if they are ever in a plane crash, that will be dragging themselves out by their hands because their legs are broken, the teeth are in the back of their throat, and they have a projectile on their head. Luckily, that won't be you. If you see a TikToker saying dumb things or you don't know if it's dumb, just tag me in the comments or send it to my Instagram and maybe you'll be on here. Let's get into it. Are planes with four engines safer than those with two? Statistically speaking, yes. If one fails above an ocean, you have more than one backup. However, plane engines nowadays are much safer than they used to be in the 90s. Today, jet engines are so safe that a quad jet has a higher chance of a failure than a twin jet. So this is coming from the genius who earlier told you to descend to 4,000 feet into a mountain and then use your cell phone to call for help. So he's taken the fact that these engines are more reliable now than they used to be, which is true, and spun it around to make it something that's scary. The technological advances they've made over the last 20 and 30 years in aviation, the research and development they've done have made planes and engines significantly safer than they used to be. So that part of his video is true. But then he says this. That a quad jet has a higher chance of a failure than a twin jet. First, if you don't want to sound stupid, don't ever call that plane a quad jet. Nobody calls it a quad jet. They do call a twin engine plane a two engine plane. They will call it a twin but you will never hear a four engine plane called a quad jet by anybody. And then he says, you have a higher likelihood of having an engine failure on a quad jet than a twin engine aircraft. That's like saying you have a higher likelihood of having a flat tire when you're driving a car versus a motorcycle because you have four tires. Or saying you have a higher likelihood of losing a game when you play four instead of two because you're playing four. So yeah, the likelihood of losing your engine is higher because there are more engines. So he's taking this fact and spinning it around in a way to confuse people to make it seem like this scary likelihood of something happening because you have four engines instead of two. It makes no sense. A 747 flies fine on just three engines. It's really not a big deal. And even a two engine jet or a twin jet can fly fine on one engine. There's all kinds of safety protocols when you're crossing the ocean that they have to follow that we don't because we have four engines. So if we lose an engine while we're crossing the ocean, it's not a big deal. If they lose an engine, they have a certain route that they're following to make sure that they are close enough to be able to land at an airport. So there's different protocols that they have when they only have two engines. So the scenario that he's saying, okay, you got four engines and you have a higher likelihood of adding an engine failure is really just to induce fear because people think losing an engine is this big, big problem. It's not, we train for it all the time. So the only useful part of his video is the part where he says that there's been an advancement in the safety of these engines since the 90s. That part is true. So you may wonder, why would a person spend so much effort spreading false and incorrect information and things like that to scare people? Maybe it's because that he's trying to make an account big enough to sell it for $2,000 so he can get paid and he doesn't care if anybody's scared or freaked out about aviation as a result of it. It's four scary things about planes pilots won't tell you. Between 43 and 54% of pilots have admitted to falling asleep at the controls. 33% of them then stated that they woke up to find their co-pilot asleep too. Some airlines are flying with less than recommended fuel levels in an effort to save money. And finally, passengers who sit more than five rows from an exit have greatly reduced chances from evacuating a plane during an emergency. When he says this part, I was like, what? Between 43 and 54% of pilots have admitted to falling asleep at the controls. I've seen it mentioned in the past about pilots falling asleep. And while there are a few cases that have been reported of pilots falling asleep and both pilots falling asleep, it's pretty rare. But then when they're mentioning this survey, I'm thinking, I've never gotten a survey of any kind about this. So I decided to do what these TikTokers don't do and do some research. Here's what I found out. A pilot union sent out a survey to 500 pilots after their country had passed a law basically allowing for an extremely long workday for pilots. So now if you're only surveying 500 pilots, that's a very small group. I don't know if these people were hand selected, but it is possible. Having a union in charge of doing a survey of a small group of possibly hand selected pilots when they're trying to prove their point about long workdays 
clearly doesn't make it into Bobby's TikTok video. It's very easy to skew survey numbers when you pick from a very small group. To answer the question now, is do pilots fall asleep or go to sleep when they're flying? The answer is yes. It depends on the country though. Different countries have different rules of what you can do and when you can sleep. What I've heard over the years, especially when you're doing a long haul flight over the ocean at night, there's nobody to talk to for hours and hours and everything is very separated and regulated on speed and things like that. So there's really nobody to talk to or nothing to do for hours. So in that scenario, you might have one pilot say to the other pilot, hey, I'm tired, can you give me 20 minutes? Then that lets the other pilot know, hey, I need to stay awake no matter what. And the other pilot will catch 20 minutes, a power nap. Anybody who's had a power nap knows you can feel super refreshed afterwards. Now again, different countries are different. Some allow that, some don't, but there is a possibility that that guy falls asleep, yes. And is it possible the other person falls asleep? It is possible, but typically in that scenario where you tell the other guy, I need 20 minutes, well, you can muster it up to stay awake for 20 minutes knowing that the other person is asleep. So is there a lot of plane crashes that's been going on because both pilots have fallen asleep? No. So when I'm in the back riding as a passenger over a long flight over the ocean, am I ever thinking, I wonder if those guys are sleeping up there? No, that doesn't concern me at all. What would concern me is what he says here. Some airlines are flying with less than recommended fuel levels in an effort to save money. It would only concern me though if it was true, which it's not. Again, Bobby failed to do his homework. Dang it, Bobby. Here is the thing. Every country has rules that's mandated by their country as far as for what the fuel requirements are. There is no recommendation. There's a legal requirement that every airline is required to have flying somewhere. Now the rules are different depending on the type of flying they're doing. If you're doing a long flight across the ocean to a different country and blah, 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 there are requirements. If you're doing a domestic flight, there are requirements. If you're doing a flight in a plane without the passengers and it's just you in there and it's the middle of the daytime, there are different requirements. So there are a lot of different requirements where we're not gonna get into, but there, there is a requirement legally that you're required to do. It's not a recommendation. And the other thing to keep in mind is that the pilots, like me, when we have all the information on what the weather, where we're going, what the winds are gonna be, all that information, then we have the right and the ability to say, we need more gas. So at the end of the day, the pilots make the decision and realize that you as a passenger that are riding back there, the pilots are there with you. We don't have ejection seats, there are no parachutes for us. So as we get on the plane and we know, hey, we're gonna fly to this place, we know that we're gonna need enough gas to get there, time to wait, maybe some weather needs to go, or maybe we need to go to a different airport. We're planning and thinking about all those things. So there is a requirement that you're legally required to have. And it's true, if you were to haul around a bunch of extra gas unnecessarily, it is a waste and the airlines will not let you haul on an unlimited amount of gas across the ocean if you don't need it because it's a huge waste of money. But there is no just recommendation. There's a legal requirement which you're required to have. So this whole thing about flying below that is not legal and would never happen. Have pilots taken too little gas and ran out of gas? We call it fuel starvation. Has that occurred? Absolutely. But typically it doesn't happen with your airliners. So me as an airline pilot, when I'm factoring in how much fuel I'm gonna take, I'm not factoring in costs. Typically in my experience, when I've seen planes run out of gas, besides some crazy malfunction or something like that, when I've seen planes run out of gas, it's typically because those people involved are also involved in the cost of things. They're trying to keep as much money in their pocket as they can. As an airline pilot, that doesn't factor in at all. We don't ever think, okay, I don't wanna to take too much gas because this is gonna come out of my pocketbook. All we care about is safety. We wanna get there safely and that's all we're concerned about. And it's set up like that as a reason. The airline's never gonna to say to you, no, 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 you can't do that, that's not safe, unless you were doing something ridiculous, saying like, I wanna fly there and then once I get there, I wanna have an extra five hours of gas once I get there. They're not gonna do that. But they don't care if you wanna take a little bit of extra gas, more than they originally allocated to you, as long as you can justify your reasoning behind it. They don't care. Now let's talk about this last thing that he said. The passengers who sit more than five rows from an exit have greatly reduced chances from evacuating a plane during an emergency. I get the logic about wanting to sit next to an exit row. The thing that most people don't know is that manufacturers are required to show that they can get everyone off, including the crew, off of a plane in 90 seconds. Now granted, these people are trained to do this, so they're not grabbing their overhead bags and picking up their backpack. These people are trained in, in getting off a plane as quickly as possible. But 90 seconds is very fast. Now I realize they don't look as reliable of a source of factual information because I haven't figured out this overlay where these heart emojis fly around my head. But let me pull up this piece of information from the FAA website. This is straight off the FAA. 
the operator must show that the aircraft, emergency equipment, and emergency procedures allow the evacuation of the aircraft at full seating capacity, including crew members, in 90 seconds or less. Again, I'm sure these are trained people, and they're getting off the plane in 90 seconds. It will be slower with a bunch of untrained people. I agree. But really, the only thought you should be having when you're getting onto a plane and you're picking your seat, the only thought you should have is, do I want to sit next to the window so I can take pictures out the window for the gram, or do I want to sit in the aisle so I can get up and go pee whenever I want? Those are the only two things that I factor in when I'm choosing my seat. So if it works for me, it'll probably work for you. Here's the only way to survive a plane crash. When booking your flight, try to get a seat in the exit row or within five seats from it. People in those seats have the highest survival rates. Wear pants and a long sleeve shirt made of non-inflammable material like cotton or denim. And sturdy shoes. You want clothes that don't restrict movement, but also protect you against flames and flying debris. Bring a smoke hood or a wet cloth in a plastic bag. Most people survive impact but die of smoke inhalation. If you don't have these, breathe through your clothes. When boarding the plane, count the seats between you and the nearest front and rear emergency exit. So if it gets smoky, you could feel your way to safety. When instructed, brace yourself by putting your feet on the ground, crossing your arms on the seat in front of you, and lowering your head. Remain that way until you come to a complete stop, then by crouching so you still get some air, leave the plane and get away as far as possible. So finally someone that had some logical things to say. And, and there was one thing on here though that was maybe the weirdest thing I've heard so far of all of these videos. And that's this. Bring a smoke hood or a wet cloth in a plastic bag. If you're gonna fly around and be so scared about the potential risk of being in a crash that you're gonna fly around with a smoke hood or a plastic bag that you can put water in in the event and all that stuff that he was talking about, that's just crazy. That would be like if you had a Jaws of Life that you kept in your car that had an adapter for your cigarette lighter that you could use that for power in the event that you were in a car crash but still alive that you could use the Jaws of Life to get yourself out. That would be the equivalent of that makes no sense. You have a very limited amount of space that you can carry. Obviously, there's restrictions now on how heavy your bag can be and how big your bag can be if you're carrying it on. Don't waste the space with something like a smoke hood for the event that you could be in a plane crash. That's a waste. Because if you are in a plane crash, you're not going to have time to be getting up into the overhead, getting your smoke hood out, and if you have a smoke hood out in your lap through the whole flight, people are going to think you're a total weirdo. But I did like the part here where he talks about the shoes. And sturdy shoes. You want clothes that don't restrict movement, but also protect you against flames and flying debris. If you want to be safe, and this is something that if you really are concerned about being safe, the best thing that you can do is wear some sturdy shoes and always wear them through takeoff and landing. You always want to wear those shoes because if you do have to get off the plane, let's say an engine explodes on the takeoff roll, which has happened. Engine explodes. That means there's engine all over the runway there. And you're going to maybe get out if there's fire or things like that. You're going to get off of that plane on the runway. And there's going to be stuff and debris all over the place. So you're going to want to exit that aircraft quickly. And you're not going to want to be stepping on hot pieces of metal or who knows what out there when you're jumping off the wing or sliding off the slide. You're not going to want to be jumping onto things. So the amount of people that I see when they get onto planes and before the plane is even pushed back, before the doors even close, have taken their shoes and socks off and are disgustingly sitting there with their bare feet next to me, I'm thinking, that is the worst idea I've ever seen. You don't necessarily need these pilgrim shoes that, that they're showing right here, but if you want to be safe, keep your shoes on until we at least get to the cruise portion of the flight. So if you want to be safe, leave your shoes and socks on the entire flight. I do, so you can do it as well. And if you are going to take your shoes off, at least be wearing socks. The amount of hairy men's feet that I've seen is way more than I've ever, ever wanted to see. Frank, this isn't OnlyFans. Nobody wants to see your feet. I've had people sending me this type of clip for years and someone even told me that one of the manufacturers had a patent on it but there's a big flaw in it one i'm guessing the only people that are able to eject these passengers are the pilots so at the same time that we're ejecting you we are also killing ourselves because the plane now is going to be totally messed up on the weight and the balance and while you as a passenger are falling into hopefully an unpopulated area we're now into a crazy emergency tumble and hoping that we don't hit a city with these jet wings that are now full of fuel and possibly on fire. If you would consider the amount of weight that would be added to make this even remotely possible, it would reduce the amount of bags, reduce the amount of passengers that could be taken, and it's just not very likely. It also doesn't factor in the possibility of a malfunction. So there you are, 
in your seat, reclined back one or two inches as you're cruising across the ocean. And then there's a malfunction. And now your, your plane shoots off. You see the rest of the plane fly off. And there you are floating down in the middle of the sea over the Atlantic in the middle of December. And you're thinking, oh, this is great. So now there's this malfunction. Your plane's flying fine, but now you've been ejected from your plane. So now the pilots are dead and you're sitting in the middle of the ocean uh, in rough weather waiting for a rescue ship to come and get you. No. Now parachutes are practical on small single engine, maybe two or four seater aircraft. For something like that, I can see parachutes are a practical thing. But for something like this on a commercial airliner, it's just not very practical. I wouldn't want to be there riding in the back thinking, okay, I hope something doesn't happen where I get ejected because that would honestly make me more nervous than being in the middle of the ocean and having an engine failure. That would make me nervous, but not nearly as bad as the possibility of a malfunction where I get ejected from the plane that would make me a lot more nervous. So if someone with my limited brain capacity can pick apart all these different problems, I can only imagine what an engineer with a big brain can do to see all the potential problems that I didn't even consider. If you wanna see me roasting some of the original TikTokers that told people how to survive a plane crash, check out this video here. And if you wanna see some pilots dealing with air traffic control and having it not go well at all, check out this video up here. I look forward to hearing from you. Until then, keep the blue side up.